anyway, now nice to meet you, man. It's been I I I was thinking like um I was so unbelievably like excited when Ty said to me, You should get Paul on. I was like, Really? Would I be able to get Paul on? He's like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I'll say, I'll message him for you. I'll see if he'll see if he'll do it. Cause Ty's an absolute legend. How long have you known Ty for? Uh, uh several years. Um We've worked together at uh, Hell City in Columbus a couple times, and uh, you know, see him on the road. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I saw Ty. He's a good guy. I like yeah, Ty a lot. He is. he is. He's a really good guy. He came over. He told me about the collaboration you did. Where I think it didn't. It's such a huge tattoo, but I think it took like how long? It didn't take all day, did it? God, I don't remember. Uh, it was a few hours, I'm sure. Yeah. We're gonna continue on it too. So. Yeah, but. I suppose every one of these that I've start, that I've done with tattoo artists just recently, it's always started with with the COVID nineteen situation, and I'm like, it's always been like, oh, we're not working, and it's been so sad. Have you started working again yet? Uh, yeah, I started last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Um, but I'm in a private location now. I closed the shop and uh, moved on. You know. Yeah. Um, I uh, decided to get out of my lease. I managed to find a loophole. So rather than continue to pay enormous rent in an uncertain time, I decided to just get out of it. You know, too much stress, man. It yeah. fucks up with my art. <laughs> yeah, man. I always find that. It definitely does. Did you, how, long, how long have you actually been at that location for then? Uh, I think six or seven years. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So where do we, right. I suppose actually this is going to delve onto other questions that I want to ask you, but so like, where were you, where were you before that then? Cause for some reason in my mind, I thought last rate rights had been open for over a decade for some reason, but where were you before oh, yeah. that? I, I opened it in 98, ah, okay. but I'm on my third location in New York. Right. In okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. How long did you go? Did you, and you were the one that started Last Rights in a sense. So you've, you've, you've started Last Rights and just had, you've just moved a sense in the shop just through locations. But it, has, it, has it always yeah. been? Cool? Yeah, uh, Last Rights Tattoo Theater. Uh, it's seen, um, started as a small shop, like 700 square feet down in the East Village in New York. I was there for nine years. And then uh, I did seven years in Midtown with an art gallery because I needed to, upsize uh for the gallery and so i moved to midtown for the space because you can't get the space you need downtown you know yeah and uh i was there for seven years and then i moved to this new location which was three floors five thousand square feet in hell's kitchen and uh that worked out great that was fantastic high rent but great location yeah i can imagine the rent being super high i think it like there's i speak to some people <clears throat> some of my uh, tattoo friends down in London and just some of the rent down there, the, the, the rates that they have to charge their customers just because the rates yeah. on the actual rent is ridiculously high. It's like, yeah. It's a, yeah you want to be a cool area, you're going to pay for it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but, but as well, you're going to, you, you do get the footfall as well there, don't you, as well? People will travel to you if you're a sort after artist, but not only that, you well, are that, going to get the footfall. Yeah, that's the thing is we could be anywhere. We're a destination. So, you know, it got to the point where I'm like, you know, I don't really need to be in Midtown. It's more of a hassle for my clients than anything. Um, because parking's like 60 to 80 bucks a day. Hotels are like three to 400 a day. It costs them as much to come see me as me, <laughs> yeah. you know? Uh, so yeah. it's like, you know, now I'm in a private location right outside of the city for like the next year. At which point I'll decide if I want to open up shop again or stay solo. I'm not really sure. Yeah. I like I'm kind of enjoying not being a boss anymore. Uh, and the amount of stress that has been reduced is tremendous. So like my art is starting to prosper again rather than struggle with the stress of business. You know, I'm tired of business stress. So now I'm free to do what I want, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, where I want to go. You know, it's great. I'm really starting to thrive. So yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to be said for that. I think, to be honest, I think I think when you work, I said, like you said, when you've got it can muddle your brain a bit too much. I think especially when you know how you work best, and if you're not producing the art that you want to produce, because I. Right. 
I don't know. I, saw, I suppose it swings and roundabouts to a certain degree, though, because I, I, I've tried working on my own. Uh, I only work with one other person. But the, sometimes when I work on my own, I find, I don't even know, it's not a lonely job, really, is it? Because you are working with people. You, are, you actually have to be with a new person every day. But we are all aware that there's some days that turn around and there's a client that walks through the door that's not particularly... <laughs> How do you explain this without being... Yeah. Uh, that's not particularly someone who you want to talk to to a certain degree but um i don't know i I enjoy working with people but then when the odd time comes around when i'm on my own i enjoy that too i really do buzz off that to be honest yeah yeah Yeah. well you know when i paint i'm all alone when i'm tattooing i'm with a client so it's like i spend all day tattooing and playing with other people's demons you know and then i spend all night painting and playing with my own so it's kind of a good balance you know (laughs) that's very well put (laughs) that's very well put so paul like when you when you were like let's take it all the way back like when you were a kid did you i mean because you've got a particular art style right now when you were a kid did you do art as a child and if you did art as a child was it anything like the art you're producing now or has that just been an evolution through time? Um, the funny thing, you know, at the beginning of this lockdown, I started going through my storage stuff and uh, looking for stuff to post. And I found a bunch of art from my childhood. And I think I posted it on Instagram recently or a couple months ago of a uh, drawing I did when I was eight. And it's all like, guys getting impaled and their heads drilled into and their guts split open and you know um all my old drawings are super villains and fucked up shit like that so (laughs) i've always been demented apparently um and uh you know i uh i've always made art that's always been my way of getting attention you know uh, or any accolades of any kind so as a child that moved me to make more art so I was a painter, uh, actually teaching airbrush as well before I even picked up a tattoo machine. Ah, really? I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that. In high school, I used to airbrush hot rods and bikes and stuff. Wow. And denim jackets, of course. Yeah. Right, okay. And then what was like, it's weird. I do ask a few people this question as well, and as I've had so many different question, different answers to it. So how did it, how did your... How did that evolve into being a tattoo artist? I mean, it must have been quite a while ago, but when, when did it first, well, first evolve um, into that? Uh, when I was 19, I had a kid, and my friend suggested I get her name tattooed on me to kind of cope with being a dad at 19. And I thought <laughs> it was a good idea, you know? So I went to the most reputable shop I could find in my area and uh, got her name tattooed on me, and I watched him do it, and I just fell in love with it. I knew it was something I was built for right away, and uh, so I scrounged money together and uh, got an apprenticeship uh, eventually with the guy, and uh, ended up becoming the shop manager in a couple of years, and then moved on from there, and my art as a tattooer kind of blossomed after three years when I suddenly had the freedom to do whatever I wanted, for that I was in a street shop, so traditional. So people would pick designs off the wall and I would customize them as best I could, but it was designs off the wall. So it was what it was. But like when I left there and ended up not having a boss, I could draw my own shit and do whatever I wanted. And, and uh, that's when I really started to come out, you know? Yeah. More monsters and demons and things like that. And it comes natural to me. So you would have, I mean, you would have had to do what everybody's done then. So when you first became a tattoo artist, you had to pay your dues in a sense of just doing the things that were in fashion at that point, obviously. Yeah, well, like, I didn't mind it, you know, because I knew, like any kind of art medium, you need to build a foundation. You need to know the rules. You need to know the fundamentals of the art and the technical side of it, where tattooing has a tremendous technical side to it, unlike other mediums. So there was a lot to learn, and, I, you know, I occasionally complain probably by my 1,000th Tasmanian devil holding a beer <laughs> with red eyes. But, uh, um, but I, you know, the first Tasmanian devil I did was an attempt at what was on the wall. And the last one I did, 5,000 of them later, had ripped veins and hair texture. Yeah. And, you know, just I couldn't help myself, you know. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, I did the, the basics. I did the, the foundation. I, I cut my teeth, paid my dues, didn't bitch about it because I knew I needed it. If I really wanted to push forward, you need to have, a, have that foundation. Yeah, like it definitely is the case, isn't it? You can't you can't just step straight into something. You do have to learn it. Like it's like yeah. I always think it's like a joiner. You can't you don't just become a good joiner or or a good welder or anything like that. Um, you know, or a good me- uh, metal fabricator. You have to learn right. the, the 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 nuts and bolts of it, so to speak, in order to become something. Then I think that's how you be. You have to learn the basics, and then you just apply your. Yeah. Basic, uh, well, if you want to. If you want to break the rules, you got to learn what the rules actually are first. Yes. So you know what to break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was it? What do you? What would you think at such a young age? Created such a macabre kind of um, uh, mindset when you when you were to create. Would you put that to like films or music or anything like that? What would you say your early influences that made you create something like art like that? Uh, well, it was the freedom, you know, I could draw what I wanted and what I wanted was monsters. I've always been there, you know, darkness. And uh, um, I was picked on a lot and bullied as a young child. And uh, I was very angry. Once I got into high school, I found punk rock. So I got even more angst built into me, you know. And uh, with that comes art with anger, you know, yeah. express yourself. This is what you feel. This is what I drew. Um, I, when I got into tattooing, you know, once I found the freedom to do what I wanted was when the demons really came out and I didn't expect there to be any call for it. I mean, in my day, there were the scariest thing to choose on the wall was a flaming skull, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I came along with demons with their skin ripped off and, uh, shit like that. Honestly, it just hadn't been done on skin before that I'm aware of anyway. And uh, so I kind of introduced that and <clears throat> didn't really think about it as any kind of uh, mainstream, not that it's ever mainstream, but I mean, popular uh, I know style, you, mean. you know, I didn't plan on building a style that would become so popular. I knew there was an ask for every seat and there'd be people that want it, but I didn't expect it to kind of explode. Yeah. I spent years just trying to keep up with it, honestly. <laughs> I think like anything though, when you create a baby, it grows, isn't it? So like you see you yeah. have seen over the years, you, you create a style and then you see because we live in such a, a small but big world, you know, that's that's becoming even more saturated with artists that you can see every single day and what they produce, you know, like when you've created such a you've like you've created this baby yourself like you say you didn't even know you were doing it and then you did it and now it becomes something that you can see i I mean i i can see um your inspiration in so many people's work Um, yeah yeah you know and that that i I don't know it's weird isn't it because everything's got to come from somewhere doesn't it you know and that's why i was trying to think about there like how did it come from you you know like it's how did you for me you know my mentors were from a distance you know like boris vallejo frazetta Wow. Caravaggio, Giger, uh, those are my main ones, you know, um, and, you know, they showed me you can really invent anything. Um, Giger uh, showed me that you could create entire worlds, you know, with uh, atmosphere and, and uh, degree of reality in, the, in it, you know, not that it's real, but when it feels real. Yeah. is when I think surrealism can be a real success, you know? And uh, when you can imitate reality, but twist it and distort it and have it still be perceived as some degree of reality, that's kind of cool. You know? Yeah. It's like redefining, redefining it. People like to see that as well, I think. I think people, uh, well, um, a lot of people like to see it, not everyone, but I don't know. It's something that I was always drawn to just that kind of something that's real, but not real. But, you know, like you say, when you used to think of monsters and things like that, everybody's, they're all just figments of, of imaginations of what we've built up over time. You know what I mean? There's definitely not monsters walking around, you know, but like. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true, actually. That's a good point. But, you know, like, uh, I love seeing, it's weird. I always used to think to myself, and you've got to stay with me here. 
But imagine if like what we're actually uh, channeling through something as human beings is actually exists on another planet in another galaxy somewhere else. You know what I mean? Like the, the demons and monsters that you create, is it something that already exists somewhere else? I don't know. Well, it exists in my head. That's where art comes from, you know. Um, I, uh, I invent, I create, you know, I imagine. Uh, and uh, I materialize it in art. You know, art is, it, it's really just expression. Yeah. So I'm expressing whatever's in my head and it becomes reality when I put it to art so other people to view it and experience it. Uh, that's really, for me, what art is. So uh, it's very real to me because it's trapped in my head. If I don't get it out in art, I get it out in murder, you know? So, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, I prefer art because it doesn't have as many repercussions. You yeah, know? you've still got your freedom but, then to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what you mean. Is it, did, you, did you like delve into other mediums before you became a tattoo artist? Obviously you did your painting, yeah. your airbrushing and stuff like that. Was it, have you always been? We, we, I'm an explorer. I explore. Yeah. When I see a medium that interests me, I jump on it and I yeah. do everything I can to master it. And then, uh, you know, I continue to do it. Sometimes it drifts away as less of a priority, but I have a whole list of mediums I still want to work in, like glass sculpture, for example, uh, um, uh, what else, um, all kinds of stuff, you yeah. know, I sculpt in clay, I sculpt in 3D design, uh, I paint, I tattoo, I um, attempt to make music, I, uh, I do whatever interests me. If I see a creative angle on something, I like to do my take on it. But, you know, I, I, I really, uh, I start with understanding and trying to master the tools because that's important if you want to really push your limits. Yeah, yeah, it's def it goes back to learning like a craft, like you say, tattooing, you've got to learn the nuts and bolts before you, you progress with yeah. it, create what yeah. you want to create in your head, yeah. I know what you mean. Like when you were moving forward as well, like uh, so when you obviously became uh, a tattoo, can you remember your first tattoo actually? I've just popped into my, can you remember your very first? Yeah, yeah, I found a buddy of mine, it was skulls and some thorns <laughs> that I had drawn actually and uh, put it on his forearm. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was my first one. I don't have pictures of it, or I do somewhere, but I don't know. Horrible tattoo, of course, <laughs> but you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, it is what <laughs> it is. Free, isn't it? it doesn't matter so much, you know. No. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. I remember my first, and it was. I think it, I got the. I think what you described when you when you got your first one was what I felt when I did my first one. I did it on my uncle. And it was just like a Pisces symbol. And as soon as the ink went in the skin and I, I wiped with the tissue and it was there, it was like, holy shit, I am, yeah. I'm here. I'm in, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can create something. Yeah, it's a trip. You know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it if you so choose. I guess you could not give a shit and do whatever, but I prefer to handle the pressure and the responsibility of what's involved. I mean, if you got people waiting years to get in your chair, you really want to have a good day when they show up, you know, they certainly want you to. So, you know, I take it very seriously and, and uh, probably put more pressure on myself than I should. Whereas in a painting or something, you can just repaint it till you get it right. You know, tattooing, you got to have the confidence and the cojones to just jump in and do it right the first shot. Yeah. So, yeah. Separates the men from the boys, really. <laughs> yeah, it does. It definitely does. But do you not think over time, though? I think it's really weird. When you first do it, you feel the pressure. And then after years pass by, I, I, I mean, I've only been tattooing just like 13 years. But like as the years pass by, that confidence, I don't even think, I don't even know if I even think about it anymore. You know? I, I, no. I, no. It's just something you know you have to have, you know. You can't go into a tattoo doubting everything you do. It'll come out like shit. <laughs> you know, it's like when your customer's in pain, you, you might tend to lighten up on the needle because you feel bad hurting them. Not me. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. I don't try and hurt anybody. Don't get me wrong. But, like, I can't think about my bedside manner when I'm tattooing. I try and be nice. But the closest thing I have to compassion is bookmarked on my phone. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, 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 
I'm painting a picture like I'm an asshole, and I probably am, but uh, I'm not out to hurt anybody. But I am a sadist to a degree, and when I chuckle when you suffer, but I've suffered through it too. I sat nine hours on my head straight, you know, and I know about tattoo pain, so I have the right to chuckle. Yes. You know, um, and sometimes bedside, a lack of bedside manner can be just as useful as a bedside manner. For sure. Because, like, you know, I get my customers to shut up and sit still out of spite, you know, just so I won't laugh at them, you know, and it works. You know, if I'm sitting here patting them on the shoulder, it'll be okay. You'll be fine. Hang in there. That's not how I'm built, you know. Uh, you just got to suffer through it. Uh, you know, Pinhead said, some things must be endured, you know. And yeah, for true. sure. I, I, and I think that's that's trying to be escaped uh, this day and age, though, isn't it? With numbing cream and anesthetics yeah. and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, a, anyway, so, yeah, um, it's a rite of passage. And when you, I think that's yeah. the biggest thing, you know, when you see people walking around and it can be the smallest of uh, human and you will look at that human if they've got if they're fully clothed and you can't see anything and you wouldn't imagine that they can take such brutal torture because when yeah. you you know a back piece a back piece can there's some really really tender spots when I've been getting my back done you know like and you've just got to grin and bear it but when you look at some people you're like how the fuck have you endured that you yeah know, you, it's yeah, unbelievable yeah, yeah. you know. I think I think that's a good thing though to have that kind of um, approach though to to a certain degree because I think when I first started, you look at it and you, uh, you can sometimes not do the job that the, the the best job you know you can do because you're feeling sorry for the customer. To a, so yeah, that's why yeah that's why I don't let it interfere with the art because at the end of the day, it's the final healed tattoo is the only thing that matters. How you got there, like did you do it in one sitting or four? Or how much did they suffer? You know, what's he going to do? So everyone, oh, yeah, you know, it wasn't a good day for him. He was drunk or, you know, I was moving a lot. You know, there's no excuses that go with a tattoo. You deal with it and you wear it forever, yep. you know. And what you deal with getting it is only significant to you later. No one wants to hear, well, yeah, he fucked up here because I jumped or he fucked up here because, you know, uh, whatever reason. You know, those excuses really don't matter. The end result is the only thing that matters to me. So. Yeah, no, it's true. I think I think it is. It's definitely true. I de and and then, and I've known that myself. You know, you probably felt with your head. Um, Philip Lou did your head, didn't he? So yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know yourself. There's a level of respect there. Whenever I picked an artist, and it's it's an it's a in my opinion a high level artist. You go to that person, you sit down, you shut the fuck up and you don't say anything and try not to let, just, just, just don't move. And it's that respect that you give them because nine to, uh, most of the time I've traveled for my artwork. So then when you get, you get there, you're there to collect it. The, the last thing you want to be doing is fidgeting and making it hard work for them, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I know what you mean, man. So, um, as you, as you, as you started to uh, progress as a tattoo artist and you were obviously you became the manager, et cetera, like that. When did it start to really, um, might be a tough question for you to really answer, but when did it start to really take off for you? You know, like, I believe you, after a period of time, when did people start really traveling to collect your actual artwork? Not like reproductions of things, but your actual artwork. Oh, well, um, it really started right away with me. When I was in just under three years, uh, I had moved to California for about a year and a half. Uh, uh, my dad was dying of cancer, so I had to take care of him and some shit and whatever. We never got along. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I moved out there for like a year and a half to do that. And, uh, I, uh, that was when I was on my own and I have freedom to do what I wanted. Uh, when I got back, I did a, uh, back piece on my girlfriend at the time and brought her to a convention just to find a job. You know, excuse me, I, um, I didn't really uh, have a plan beyond finding a good shop to work in because I was tired. I came home, my job wasn't waiting for me. So I had to do tattoo parties and, you know, uh, worked in a few kitchens, you know, to pay the bills. And, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in a reputable shop. Um, so uh, I took her to the convention, entered her in a few contests and, you know, 
I got to say, man, people went nuts and I wasn't expecting it at all. They just went, they flipped over her back piece. You know, at the time, everything was fine line, West Coast, black and gray. And I came out with a five needle for a liner. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, and, um, I did this bold work that, you know, jumped, uh, I guess. And uh, at any rate, I ended up with job offers. I got invited to shops from that convention. She was on the cover of the next magazine from that convention. Um, and it got popular really quickly. Uh, and it started with invites around the country, you know, to, to shops that are artists that I, you know, really respected or looked up to, you know, I, uh, uh, so I went to visit their shops and I learned tons. I must've toured the country like six times in a van, you know, and, uh, and then it spread to Europe. I got invited to Amsterdam. That was my first outside of the country experience. Amazing city. And yeah, and uh, from there, I, you know, you'd meet people at the conventions, they'd invite you to their convention. Uh, you'd go and start spreading around and seeing new places and doing new work, building fans uh, and clients. And, you know, uh, it just kept escalating media news and, and whatnot. Um, so, you know, my style became popular fairly quickly. Um, yeah, you know, it was over a few years or whatever, but I mean, uh, uh, all I ever did, like I said before, was just try and keep up with it. I, I didn't have a plan for like conquering the world, you know, I just uh, did my art. If people wanted it, I gave it to them, you know, and, and, uh, and that's how it was. And if someone invited me somewhere and it seemed cool, I'd go. Traveling the world for over 30 years now, tattooing for 32 and plus. Incredible, man. Who, who, a question arose then when you were talking, but as you were going through that early period, what tattoo artists inspired you? You know, like who were inspired? Greg was number one. Who was that? Sorry. Greg Irons. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were various guys that were pushing the envelope in that time, you know, um, Cliff Raven, uh, Greg Irons, uh, those are my top two. And, and then I never met them, but like I'd see their work in books and stuff. And yeah. Greg Irons was my greatest impact because there was one particular tattoo he did. I think it was in Tattoo Advocate, an old book uh, at Hardy's. Uh, and uh, it was a sleeve of a dragon coming in and out of the skin like it was coming in and out of water. And it was the most three-dimensional dynamic tattoo I'd ever seen. I was already tattooing at the time, but it really inspired me to push my limits. You know, that had a great impact on me, that one tattoo. And then when I traveled, I met guys like Jack Rudy and uh, Freddie Negretti, Mark Mahoney, uh, Gil Monty, guys like that. Uh, Roberts and such and uh, they all had it you know were always willing to talk to me about you know geek out on tattooing and learn tons from these guys you know? um, and uh, all that stuff has stuck with me from tattooing techniques to ethics you know you name it yeah it's become I think you will attest to this to a certain degree it's become way more of an open book, hasn't it? I think you must you must uh, clarify to a certain degree, like when you first started, to the, to to the, how much of an open book it is now to techniques on how to do this that, and the other. Back in the day, it seemed to me, and I've only been I've not been tattooing long, but the person who I learned from uh, at the studio, and the person he learned from, he, you know how much it's actually changed and how much information used to be held so close to the chest. So I feel like like you're saying when you were moving around, that would, would have been the only way to start to pick up new techniques. Yeah, uh, moving around, traveling was the best thing for me. You know, you stay in your hometown, what are you gonna learn? Even if you got a good artist there, you're only learning one perspective. And uh, uh, there's so many others, you know, you gotta throw in the melting pot and mix it all together and see what you come up with. Um, you know, I take a little from here, take a little from there and reinvent it into my own way that made sense for me. I mean, that's what it is. And, and when you travel and go to conventions and meet new people and watch them work, uh, your melting pot grows, you know, more, more and more. 
Um, I, uh, I didn't really, yeah, I'd say traveling was the best thing. Um, I learned more when I left my original shop than when I was there. I learned the old Spalding and Rogers methods, you know, and uh, I started out mopping the floor and cleaning the toilets and making needles and mixing color and scratching acetate stencils with, and charcoal and all that stuff. Um, and I love that I did, you know, it's a great part of my past, my, my memories and stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, ethics and that sort of thing, I was taught that if a tattoo is not going to look good in 10 years, then it's not a tattoo. And, uh, uh, I've stuck by that. Yeah. You know, I got into this because it's permanent and it's sad to me that these days less and less people care that it's permanent, you know, and they'll spend more money than they ever have and be fine with the fact that it's going to fall out in a year because the artist that they went to has awesome Instagram pictures, but in reality, it's all bullshit, you know? So yes. true words spoken. I think that's the, it's, it's very hard. Not everyone, of course, you know, no, of there's course a lot not. of talent out there. You know, guys like us can see what's bullshit or not. Unfortunately, the public can't. You know? okay, exactly. So they're taken advantage of by like Photoshop rock stars. You know? Yeah, I was just talking to my colleague the other day about that. And it, it's, it's, it's a really tough one to, to kind of grasp because I just, you know, as an individual artist, you're in charge of your work, your, your creations. And to, 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 I cannot even imagine what pro thought process you go through to actually have to create something. You go all the way, you know, through with the process, you get to the end. And then when the, the, your client goes, you put it through Photoshop and you bump right. the lights up and you push the blacks back even darker. And yeah, yeah. I just don't get it. Because, yeah. you know, because now pictures on Instagram, the way I see it, is they're not tattoos. They're mixed media pieces. You know, once you start oversaturating your tones and your colors and enhancing it for the web, it's now a mixed media piece. It involves photography, digital manipulation, tattooing, um, and that sort of thing. It's no longer just a tattoo, you know? Um, so I guess when you look at it as a mixed media piece, you know, it, well, it loses something, you know, really, because they're not yeah. supposed to, you exactly. know? And, and I photograph my work. I don't use any filters or nothing. And I try and get it to look as real life as I can. My blacks are not you know, hashtag zero, 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 you know, um, that's impossible. I'd rather let people see what it really looks like. And I prefer they see it healed than fresh anyway. Yeah. You know, that's maybe not, un that's maybe not popular on Instagram. Like you look like you're less than everyone else because of it. But the fact is they couldn't do it. If they don't have their initial like enhanced photo, they got nothing. At least when you see my work in real life, it's fucking in there. Yes. So I don't yeah. have to hide my customers a year later. No. And I think, I think any artist that's listened to this tattoo artist will attest to the fact that the real, I think even the people that edit their photos know the real deal is actually seeing a heel, a heel tattoo. Because I remember the first few times you do something yourself and you create something that looks, it looks incredible. And then the person goes away and it heals that's the true test. And when you see it, that's right. when you're like, ah, oh, shit, I should have gone darker there. Or right, oh, right. I didn't really, right. and that's how you learn. But to go away and try and trick, it's not the, it's not the thing is Paul, it's not the tattoo artist that you're tricking, is it? Because look at us, we're talking about it right now. You're yeah. tricking the general public. Everyone wants to be a rock star, man. Yeah. And tattooers are the new rock stars, you know? So like, you know, we, like any industry that has its rock stars, like the music industry, you know, everyone wants that. So everyone picks up a guitar and learns how to play and does everything they can do to be a rock star. And a lot of them become posers trying to do it because being the ego inflating, you know, the self masturbating of your ego of, of trying to uh, um, be somebody that gets all this attention supersedes the quality of the art. It's not about the art anymore. It's about the fame. And that's kind of sad. I've been dealing with fame for a long time. And it's got its goods and it's got its bads, pros and cons to anything. Careful what you wish for. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't complain. I have a lot of perks that I enjoy. I won't lie. But there's also, you know, a lot of shit you got to deal with from politics to pressure to, you know, 
always having to be Paul Booth and, you know, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm not, again, I'm not bitching about it. I'm just pointing out that like these people, they, they lack the self-respect to do it on its own merit. Let the art speak for itself instead, you know, but most people that suck tend to have bigger mouths <laughs> tend to have more shit to say about how wonderful they are. I don't know any quality, competent, serious, good tattooers that walk around bragging about how great they are. But the shitty ones just never shut up. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, it's, it's, and, and that's really what it is. Photograph manipulation in, in Adobe is just posers who can't shut up. Yeah, yeah, I think it's definitely true. I think 100%. I think it's the most, probably one of the most disgusting attributes that somebody can actually have when you actually, somebody tells you that they're good or somebody, you know, like obviously bra it, it, there's a certain amount of bragging going on with stuff like that. And I think that is, I, I think like you say though, the true test comes when you're walking around a tattoo convention. If you're, if you're, if, if somebody from the general public who's actually listening to this right now, the real test is take yourself to, you know, if you're in the UK, London tattoo convention, you will see people going around and that's the true test. That's when you actually see a back piece walking around that's healed that somebody's like, yeah. um, somebody's brought to the convention and being like, would, you know, would you come and, and, and stand at my booth and, uh, and walk around the, uh, the convention? That's when it's right. breathtaking and that's when you right. realize and you see when somebody's actually got this and they know what they're doing, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, this is back in the day when a convention banner was full of pictures of your tattoos. Now a convention banner is a mugshot of you and no tattoos. <laughs> now, you know, maybe it's not a big deal, but like, I look at things like that, you know? Yeah. Like, I look at your banner, and I want to see the name of your shop or who you are, but I'm interested in your art. That's why I'm here. I don't really care what you look you know, but now it's, it's, it's just so diluted and, and like, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I'm not a hateful old man, but I am grumpy, you know, uh, <laughs> because any old man sees the changes and some of them are good. Some of them suck, you know, um, I've always had a problem with inflated egos. Uh, I hate to hear people bragging about themselves. I find it an inferior thing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I generally, uh, shy away from it you know i try not to brag and say well, if i do it's by accident you know but at least i'm aware of that like you know uh, there's always someone better than you out there and to walk around thinking you're the shit I, it limits you you're not going to learn anymore if you think you're the man no yeah and, it's kind of and, a, you're a closed book at that point then aren't you really yeah which you'll be forgotten in a year or two you know this year the big rock star now congratulations but you know what uh, once you have a hit song, you know, you can be a one hit wonder or you can continue to produce hit songs because your heart is in it and you're genuine. It's authenticity that is the, the, the long haul, you know, yeah. the uh, staying power is in the authenticity of what you do and not in your attitude. Yeah, man. Well, of course, I can't say much about pop music and you know, whatever, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> You, you know, some things have validity, some don't. <laughs> That's just tastes, isn't it? It's down to like yeah, some people yeah. like shit music yeah. and some people like good music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Talking about music, man. Um, I, you've had like, wow, well, I like. It's like some people will be super, super jealous at some of the people that you've had chance to work on. But you've tattooed some some really good musicians over the years. Tell me some yeah. of, who, who what some of the best experiences you've had. You 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 tattooed Kerry King, didn't you? Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And yeah, Philip and Salmo and uh, all the old metal guys. You know, I haven't been touring anymore because living on a bus is like bullshit. You know, so to, touring, like you were you. So I oh, used to bus hop. Like every summer, I would go out with a band and then we'd cross paths with another band after a week or two or a few weeks. And I'd jump on another bus and hang out with them for a while, always tattooing in the green room or, or backstage, um, hanging out with bands. It was a great lifestyle, crazy, you know? Um, but I had a lot of fun. Uh, it started in 94, Igor Cavalera from Sepultura was my first uh, rock star that I tattooed, you know, and uh, that first tour was uh, Pantera, Sepultura, and Biohazard, uh -huh. and I tattooed all of them, 
you know, and uh, uh, it was a blast and I fell in love with it. Cause you know, I was a metal head and uh, I loved the music that I, you know, so being there with the bands backstage was awesome. It was fun. You know? um, when you have musicians that inspire you that, you know, I'm not going to say look up to, but inspire you. Um, it's very inspiring to work with them on a tattoo. It's like a collaboration, you know, when you're tattooing, like Slayer, when I tattooed Kerry King the first time, I was like, this was like a goal, you know, because I used to listen to Slayer when the boss left the shop in my, you know, first couple of years saying, oh, I wish I could tattoo Slayer someday, you know, and then it went full circle years later and I'm tattooing the band, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, there's been quite a few circles like that throughout my years that, uh, I appreciate and I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's just a musician. It's no big deal, really. But uh, from an artist's point of view, being able to work on artists that inspire you, whether they're a musician or a painter or a tattooer or, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. But something about in that collaboration when the inspiration is mutual, it's uh, really rewarding. Yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember what the saying is about something like one game respecting another game. I can't remember. I can't remember. It's escaped me now, but it's definitely true. You know, when 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 one artist that creates something um, um, admires another artist and therefore collects something from the artist, I think there's something about that. Like you said, I think this. I can only but imagine what it would have been like to you know, spend all day with them. They go to sound check. you go and watch the sound check or whatever. There would have been so many incidents and then you, then you tattoo them into the night or then you go and watch the gig, they play the gig or they've just got a, did you ever tattoo them and they went out and played a gig? Oh yeah, I've tattooed them right to the point they have to be on stage. <laughs> you know? um, and uh, oh, The Undertaker, the wrestler, when I tattooed him an hour later, he was in the ring. I'm oh. amazed the tattoo survived, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, lots of crazy, you know, times like that. I tattooed on a tour bus once, driving Whoa. down the highway. Um, I, uh, yeah, you know, there's there's always something crazy. Yeah, like you said though, it's like you said before that it might not be be a big deal to some people, but it's I don't even know if it's about being a big deal to some people. It's about being a big deal to you, isn't it? Like you just said, then yeah. it was a fucking big deal when I was tattooing Slayer, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like anyone. My Some of my favorite bands you've never heard of, you know, and they even have small followings, you know. I, I, uh, I like what I like. I don't need to fit into the status quo and like something because everyone else does. I'm not built that way. And uh, generally, people that like my art are not really built that way either. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of free thinkers and open-minded people. Or, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to tolerate what I draw if you weren't that way. Yeah. So, although I have to say, I have a lot more Christian fans than I thought I did. And that's interesting and disturbing to me at the same time. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> knowing my history, you know what I'm saying. So. That's a mind fuck. I think, I don't even know if they really truly know anyway that, you know, like I see so many people, I don't know, religious people collecting tattoos when they're not supposed to, or then people yeah. that are not religious collecting religious tattoos, or like, you know, I don't know, people, humans are fucked, they don't really know what the fuck they're doing, you know? No, well, they don't, they're, they're, it's on the surface, you know? They like the art for whatever reason, but they don't really explore why they like the art. They just like it for what it is and leave it there. And that's perfectly fine. Like I said earlier, there's an ask for every seat. But in some art, especially dark art in general, uh, uh, you get artists that have something to say, what on the surface may seem negative is actually positive underneath it all because they're addressing issues in the human condition that uh, people don't normally want to address. Now there's people that embrace these things and there's people that live in denial. A lot of Christians tend to live in denial, but when they do like dark art, it's not because always, and I, you know, I'm not saying everyone, but like most that I meet, they're like, oh, you tattooed so-and-so, you're awesome, I gotta get work from you. Or, oh, you draw these sick monsters, you know. Um, yeah, but, you know, uh, there's something at every level from the surface to the depth, you know, and I try and provide something for everyone. There's always some metaphors in my work. 
more in my paintings than my tattoos, but uh, uh, I always have something to say. Uh, subtle it may be at times, but you know, uh, with a tattoo, it depends on the individual I'm putting it on, you know? So it really has more to do with their personal views and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, do you, do you, do you get a mixed bag of, because um, we're obviously we're commissioned artists with that kind of thing whenever you're a tattoo artist. I mean, you'll probably get a massive array um, of people just asking you to do whatever you want to do or uh, either whatever you want to do or uh, I want this that I've seen you do before but do something different to it. Is that generally what happens or do you get a mixed bag of people actually telling you what you want? Um, no, I don't get those anymore. No. Um, first of all, it's a bit of a wait. And if you're serious, you'll wait. If you're not, you won't. Yeah. So by the time you get in my chair, you know what the deal is. And basically the deal with me is I don't do what I want on you. I find a medium ground where I figure out what you want and then I interpret it in my own way. So what I look for in an appointment when someone writes me, I don't want to hear about all your detailed ideas. What I want is artistic freedom to interpret your idea. If you don't know what your idea is, no worries. I can sit down with you in a consult and help you find it. That's what I do. Uh, so for me, it's about interpreting ideas that we collaborate on. Now I'll get people that'll say, do whatever you want. But even then I pick their brains to figure yeah. out what they would actually want. You know, I appreciate that they like my art so much that I could draw anything on them, but that's not what I'm here for. Uh, I'm here to interpret your own. Uh, you don't have to have broad ideas. You actually broad ideas are better than details. I don't want details. I don't want to be a paint jockey or an ink jockey. You know, I don't want to do what I'm told. I'm too rebellious for that. Uh, I want to interpret and inspire myself by being as creative as I can. And I can only do that with artistic freedom. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right there. Even someone with 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 the waiting list or the following um, that you have, it, it, you still can't go from nothing. I, I, even I, you know, I get people, you know, they'll say the exact same thing. You know, like I just have you been? Has there been something you've been wanting to do, or you know, stuff like that? It's like, yeah, that's all good, man. That's all good, but this is going on you forever. Like, there's got to be. Well no. Yeah, I you know, I started in a street shop and in a street shop it's a different mentality. Nothing wrong with it at all. But you're giving the customer what they want, whatever it is, you know, and that's perfectly fine. Uh in my realm at the other end of the spectrum where it's all art and not street shop anymore. Now it's an art space like doing a painting or what have you. Uh it's a different approach. And I'm not taking away from any other form of tattooing, I'm just speaking about my own direction yeah over the years uh paul like how have you dealt with or how do you feel uh generally about the evolution of um the machines we use uh, the, the the process obviously because i think with everything in life uh as humans we generally tend to like to cut corners make things a lot faster more efficient and we do we've seen in cars buildings etc electronics how do you feel about the evolution? Because I, I am aware, obviously, you move, you were one of my, the, for me, I use a, a Thunder, a Cheyenne Thunder. You was one of the first people that I ever saw as a, a Cheyenne-sponsored artist. When, would you, when did you first start in taking the forays into rotary machines? Uh, I think that was my first rotary that I really took seriously, but um, shied away from it quick enough into others yeah. as they came out. But I'm a tech geek, and I love technology, and I will always always embrace it mainly because I believe it's going to bring on the apocalypse and I'm all for that. So uh, <laughs> I, uh, I always jump on tech and uh, I, uh, I like to explore, as I said, and I try new tools and I ended up in a place where, you know, um, I didn't feel a need to be loyal to the coil anymore. I spent years with a coil. I have no issues with coils, but honestly, out of a good rotary, I get better precision, better balance of weight, more efficiency, both in the machine and myself. And as a result of all my exploring and trials and tribulations, it, uh, 
I'm faster than I've ever been. Not that I rush, but I can do a back piece in like eight to 10 hours, you know? And uh, um, it's because of my equipment and my mentality, you know? I work very efficiently, uh, technique wise and equipment wise. So um, I like efficiency. I don't think someone should sit there for an extra 30 hours and suffer if it's not necessary. Of course, I get in there and get the job done. You feel it, but uh, but you're done three to four times faster than you normally would be. Yeah. Get it so. I think the cartridge system was a revolution for me. I think, uh, you know, like how, how, how that, that made me more efficient, you know, just one machine that kind of, yeah, 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 things like that. Cartridges. Yeah, just swap out cartridges. Yeah, so yeah, it's good though. So you're not shying away from. I think some people are a bit more. Some people can be real purists, but I don't know if they're just like sticks in the mud. You've got to be open to trying new things, haven't you? Yeah, well, adaptation is the key to evolution and survival. So if you can't adapt, you're not going to survive. You know, you mm. could use a coil for the rest of your life. I have no issues with coils at all. I still use one every now and then, but you know. For me, uh, it slows me down. My job, my goal is for my equipment to keep up with my brain because I render when I tattoo, I scribble, I, 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 uh, I make shapes really quickly and define it and refine it as I go. You know, a tattoo for me, the first stage is an underpainting and I block in all the shapes and the light source and then I come in and do the detail and the highlights and all. Uh, I don't work in block sections like a lot of artists do. I kind of work more spatially. And uh, um, so for me, most of the time, it's like, well, how can I make this work faster? Because I don't like when my equipment slows me down and I lose my train of thought or my, my vibe of, of creating and rendering. So I need to be able to be quick. I like, a lot of my texturing styles require speed to work. You know, people think I rush, but it's not rushing. It's just how I develop the style. It's built for efficiency. That's why I'm fast. Yeah, I know what you mean. That is, sometimes it can be perceived like rushing, like, but it's, it's just you. It's, like you say, it's your brain working and trying to get it down through your fingers fast enough to start yeah. to get the textures, yeah, and stuff like that. I know what you mean. Do you ever, do you ever struggle? Um, I mean, you're such a prolific artist, and over the years you've done so many like for me, outstanding pieces of work uh, on so many different mediums, but obviously one of my favorite mediums is tattooing. So when I see some of your work um, th th that stands out, do, do you ever suffer from any kind of like, I don't even know how to put this apart from creative blocks. Do you ever struggle to create something? Does, does it ever get into your head where you're like, I'm fucking stuck. I don't, I, I can't create anything right now. What do you do? With the tattoo or in art in general? In the tattoo, you know, if somebody comes to you and, I mean, like, there's time. yeah, there's times where I get a block in a tattoo. Most of the time it's because I'm not getting a good vibe from my client. Right. You know, I rely heavily on the vibe. I know I sound like a hippie, but like that moment in time, uh, you get vibes from people, you know, and if they're a real douchebag or something, you have trouble connecting with them, of course. Mm. Uh, or there's too much going on or something bothering me. It can happen. You know, in those moments, I walk away, have a cigarette, clear my head. I have various techniques to do that, you know, mental techniques, whatever. But uh, um, and there's been times where I turned down an appointment altogether and canceled it because it just wasn't a good day. It's not all the time at all. You know, I'm pretty good at meeting uh, uh, the requirements, you know, but uh, of course you have days where get a little bit of a block of some kind um it's learning how to beat it you know maybe contour drawing to warm yourself up or, or change of environment change of conversation or no conversation at all you know it, you get into the science of it there's like left brain activities and right brain activities mm -hmm. and left brain activities are thinking logically and yeah. non-spatially and analytically and not in art space and the things that cause your left brain to be active are things like people talking or your phone ringing or real world stuff, signage, uh, music that has lyrics in it. These are all left brain shit, you know? 
right brain is like a timid little groundhog coming out looking for its shadow. Mm -hmm. So you need to build an environment like what's behind me that inspires you creatively. So everywhere I look, there's something cool that I like that's artistic in some way. Uh, and I have no left brain stimuli in my surroundings when I work. So I rely heavily on the environment. The music I listen to doesn't have lyrics when I'm working usually uh, um, because that's an interruption. Just like when your phone rings, same shit. You know, Your left brain and your right brain can't operate at the same time. It's one or the other. It's very fast, but it goes back and forth, sending information to each other. Not to geek out or anything, but no, I love it. I love essentially, it. what an artist block is is left brain dominance. That's what art, that's what block is. So you have to learn techniques to undominate or make your left brain sleepy by losing the input that it's digesting. So you create an environment that's as right brain conducive as possible, um, and then you find your art again in those moments. That's wicked. I've, uh, I've never had a better answer to that question before. That is <laughs> I do a seminar on it, actually. But, uh, really? Most people fall asleep during it, yeah. <laughs> How do you find teaching, Paul? Like, uh, I think, um, I don't know, it's, for some I love talking, so I, don't, I can't imagine. I think talking, though, would be different to standing up in front of people and presenting your, your I theory. I, I, I hate talking in front of crowds or groups. Smaller seminars are more fun. But one-on-one, uh, -on -one, I get a little too serious and I'm hard to deal with as a mentor. I'm very unforgiving and very, like, serious, you know. I could go joke around, but, like, you got to be ready for some militant action when you're getting in with me as a student, you know. Um, you'll get homework. You'll get, you know, ribbed and kicked and, and not really, <laughs> you know. Uh, but a group at a seminar is more generalized. And I can go over my notes and I can give broader strokes and then answer questions more specifically. So like, you know, a dozen to two dozen people, I'm happy. I enjoy that a lot. I love to teach. Um, but when you get into the Sensei Grasshopper thing, I'm extremely selective about who I teach. Because the main thing is I don't want to regret having taught you. I've brought a few assholes into this tattoo world and I don't want to bring any more. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird man uh, i i've i've seen uh, it's hard man i you know because we're all influenced by all, so many different things but i've definitely seen a, uh, a full circle in the sense of what we were talking about before a lot of people that ha have been influenced by your work not some so directly some very indirectly but there are some that are very directly um do you, have you ever had that, the, that happen to you where you've taught somebody, you've take, brought them on as a mentor, they've worked with you, and they become carbon copies, or they become someone that you decide, dude, no, you can think for yourself. Did you ever struggle with anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I had one guy, uh, once he learned my basic recipe, that he stopped learning. Yeah. When he imitate me was when he felt he made it rather than grow on and take my style into a new direction. So once he decided he had learned what he needed, I stopped teaching him. He stuck around for years after that, but I stopped teaching him because there was nothing to teach him. He didn't want to learn anymore, so I didn't give him any more info, you know? Um, very disappointing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it all plays out in the wash. I mean, and to this day, he hasn't improved. So, I mean, you know, I wasn't going to waste any more of my time with him, honestly. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. I think I, I've, I've never had an, an, an apprentice or anyone to teach. So it's like, it, it yeah. must be tough when you, when you, especially when it's not, you're not teaching them how to render a portrait or something. You're literally teaching them how to tattoo and then your thought press, process of your creative mind, you know, and then they just take that and just run with it. And I don't know, it's got to be a tough gig eventually to... Well, you feel like a failure as a teacher because mm. the idea is that your student becomes a monster that outgrows you, you know? That's the whole point of teaching is to create monsters in people, you know, artistic monsters. And, and uh, if you're failing at that, then why are you doing it? This is from a teacher's perspective, not a student. Teachers want something out of the relationship too. And that's what they want, you know. Unless a tattoo shop, then you're looking to hire them as an artist and 
you know, make money with them. But, uh, but as a teacher in general, whatever the medium, a creative teacher, your goal is, is to build artists and sit back and be proud that you helped mold them. You know, yeah. uh, for me, that's what it is. That's what I enjoy in teaching. But uh, when they fail at that and their, their lack of character or, or views on, on things uh, um, fall short, then you feel like you failed to. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's how seriously you want to take it though. There's plenty of teachers out there who are fine with their paycheck and move on, you know. Yeah. Well, there's some really fucking good teachers as well. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. again, I go that heralds back to it, it, it being a very open book nowadays. There's so many fucking people out there, so many amazing people out there um, that are ready to just <clears throat> teach people things. And it's just like you said, it's what they do with it, you know. I, 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 I just, I can't imagine learning things and just trying to replicate someone else's art but it's so hard in the world that we live in where if you are stuck to instagram if you are stuck to facebook you see so many other people's work that it's hard to become something else you know like because we do all take inspiration from other people you, you know like, yeah everything's been done it's how you reinterpret it just like surrealism reinterprets realism surrealism wouldn't exist without realism you know so you know without all of that those styles mixed up together um you would have less than a, you know without that influence you're not recreating it you know it, it's very rare that you see any style if it ever happens at all that is solely unique and can't be compared to anything um you know it's not so much about comparison but inspiration where it comes from you know I mean, my work comes from a number of people, Giger, uh, Jack Rudy, yeah. a bunch, you know, um, and I don't, I don't discredit any of that, you know, it's helped make me what I am today. Yeah, you know, I'm proud is. to be able to carry the flag like Giger, you know, my tattoo work is very Giger influenced because it works great on skin. My paintings aren't Giger influenced that much, you know. Um, but with, you know, working on the human body, I'm looking to build contours and shapes that complement or contradict the musculature for whatever reason. And biomechanical is ace at helping me do that. You know, the flowing shapes and flow, it's all about flow. And biomech have developed a Giger influenced style that has flow. And, and that's what's important to me. So that's what I do. It's the, I, I've said this time and time again, Paul, but it's bio, uh, like a bio-organic or if somebody's going to do a biomechanical. Oh, wait, let me stop you right there. Go for bio -organic it. Bio-organic needs to stop. Right. <laughs> There's no such thing as bio-organic. You might as well say organic-organic because yes. the whole idea is biological and mechanical mixed yes. together into a hybrid. Bio-organic I don't even know what that is. So tell everyone out there, or I'll tell them myself, fuck your bio organic because there's no such thing. It's an oxymoron. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Paul Booth and I approve this message. Let me get my <laughs> train. <sighs> I think it's one of the things, man. I think it's like one of the best languages that you can have for the skin you know like everybody can get reproductions of their favorite film characters or things like that yeah but yeah. bio or uh, like uh, things like that it's 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 absolutely unbelievable because it actually is tattoo art i see it as tattoo art because it's meant to flow with the body you know that's like that's well it's not important to everyone you know yeah I, and that's fine i, I mean I keep saying that, you know, P.T. Barnum's quote, there's an ass for every seat, you know, and it's true. Sometimes a decal tattoo is perfectly fine. Um, it's not my taste, so I don't do it, you know, but that doesn't make it wrong. It's all a matter of opinion, you know. Yeah. And in this day and age, anything you don't agree with is wrong. <laughs> and it's so easy to offend people now. Like, yeah, you know, my sense of humor is very sarcastic and it does not float in society anymore. Can I smoke? Of course you can. Of course you can. Okay. 
I'm yeah. doing. So. Sarcasm, uh, it's, it's the purest form of wit. I, I, I love sarcasm as being a Brit. I, I absolutely love it. So, so, but sometimes it's hard when you're with well, someone. You're English. Like, of course you love it. You yeah. know, I love English humor. Lau Hardy was a good friend of mine. He's the funniest fucker I've ever met. <laughs> he is an absolute fucking legend. Yeah. yeah. I think stuff like that is definitely true. Do you find yourself um, being influenced by any new, t- new tattoo artists? Anybody that you've seen over the past 10 years or recently or anybody like that that you're like, yeah, man. I've oh, yeah. There's work I like. Uh, some work I like a lot, you know. Yeah. But I don't really weigh it until i see it in real life anyway yes um if i uh if i can't look at it in real life under normal conditions then i don't really give it a full judgment and i don't travel as much anymore so i'm not seeing a lot of this stuff in real life to be able to give it a pass or a fail you know you get an idea on instagram but there's just something about seeing it in real life, you know? It's true. I mean, like a Philip Lou piece, you could see an amazing back piece photographed, healed and everything. But when you see it in real life, it's like beyond amazing. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that you just can't capture in a photo like many paintings. When do you ever capture a painting in a photo and do it justice, really? You know? Yeah. Same with you. Yeah, it's definitely true. It's always mind blowing to be walking around uh, like in museums and things like that when you see actual like Renaissance paintings and things like that. Looking yeah. at a picture of it's nothing, but when you're stood in the enormity of it, that's when you actually exactly. like, holy shit, one person yeah, yeah. did this, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you can actually get up close to it. The best thing about a tattoo as well, when you, like you say, I, I, again, another good answer, Paul, the idea of actually, I can't judge something that I've seen a picture of. If, I, if somebody, if one of my clients comes in with one of, with somebody whose work I've been admiring, and I look, and they've collected something from that ice, I can judge it from that and that alone. And right. that, yeah, you know, I think there's some. I think, you know, in the dark art side of things, uh, in the tattoo industry, there are some people, like you say, that have, that, like I said before, that have obviously come from. I want to say it like this: that are born from your baby. You know what I mean? In a sense. Oh, right, right, right. But, but, you know, but it's cool to see the evolution that people will do. Oh, yeah. I'm flattered. Whenever I see a little bit of me in somebody's work and they're doing dynamic, crazy shit, I'm, I feel content. You know, I'm flattered that I had a part in that. Um, Like people always ask me, how do you feel about people copying your style? And I say, well, when I was a teenager, I copied Giger and Frazetta and Boris and even attempted Caravaggio, you know, uh, I copied them to learn. Yeah. So does that make me an asshole too? You know, I, I mean, I'm happy that I could have an influence and inspire someone halfway around the world who I've never met that, you know, is influenced by what I'm doing. It's a reward. Yeah, yeah it definitely is, man. It definitely is. Do you ever, um, do you, you know, like, do you, what, what other things do you do? Obviously you, you, I mean, we've talked a lot about the artistic side of things. Do you, do, do you, do you have any other hobbies that you do? Do you, what, however, ta- however ways do you like to spend time? Do you? Um, I'm a horror movie fanatic. Yeah. Total horror geek. Uh, I have an extensive horror collection. Um, I collect oddities and morbid things. Um, I, uh, Oh, uh, recently I got my bike back on the road, so I'm riding every day, which is nice. It's very uh, stress relieving for me. Um, Harley, I mean, not yeah, motors- I mean motorcycle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> see me on a bicycle, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so you know, there's that currently, and uh, um, I uh, I don't really have a life much beyond that. No, that's cool. To be honest, you know, I, uh, um, it's, it's, I think my I, vacation time is still art, you know, it's just not work for me. So I don't really need vacations, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think the best thing about, I, I, I definitely feel like we have the best job in the world, but I think the best thing about our job is the idea that it's actually a fucking hobby. So the idea is like one of the biggest hobbies you get to do every single day. So I, I, yeah. I have a definite problem with having too many hobbies and, and you worry sometimes that you're spreading yourself too thin, but 
you, you, you don't really need much more, like you were saying, well, what you've got, that's enough, isn't it? You know what I mean? You don't want to well, oversaturate you know, we, we need money to live on, uh, to achieve our hopes and dreams, whatever amount of money that is for you. Um, and we need to create our art and have that outlet as an artist. When you can get paid well to create art, which is something that is not work for you, of course we got the best job. You know, what more could you ask for? I'm getting paid well to create my art freehand on people that they're gonna wear for the rest of their life. And I get to hurt them too. <laughs> and they pay me to hurt them. So it's like, hey, it's a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm really not that horrible. I'm not. Just... <laughs> Sarcasm again, Paul. I fucking love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, man, it's super cool. I, I, so, man, as you as you start to move forward and uh, from now, I think it's been a fucking really, really strange time. But it it, it feels yeah. good to slowly be coming out of it. I hope we don't enter back into some weirdness again. I, I don't know if. When it all started happening, I felt like it was going to be, oh, you know, this is never going to be the same again. But I, I'm a bit optimistic. I feel like it will be get back to relative normality, maybe. Um, but do you, what do you want to do with your with, with, with your art? Just keep producing just the way you are, keep moving forward? Do you ever worry that you will burn out or anything like that? I can't burn out. I've no. been through degrees of it in my years, you know, uh, here and there. But it's... If you're trying to evolve and push your envelope, burnout really is a non-issue. Um, you know, I don't work in just tattooing. I work equally in many mediums, several. Yeah. You know, some take priority over others depending on what my interests are at the time. But like bigger and crazier is everything I want to do. You know, massive sculptures, uh, you know, a horror hotel that scares the shit out of people. Um, an online VR exhibit of all my art and immersive stuff. Uh, um, you name it, I want to do it. I want a tattoo orbiting the moon, you know? I'm, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I like to do big, crazy shit. The bigger and crazier, the better. You know? Fuck yeah, man. That sounds amazing. Uh, it's true, though. Like, it it's hard sometimes. Like, I, like you say, you alluded to it there, though. Sometimes you do but you get a slight case of burnout. I think I've always found that if I felt something like that, we right. have the, we have the uh, power as a self, self-employed uh, human to be able to just pull back on the pedal a little bit and just take a bit of time off. I think that always works. Yeah, it depends what you're burning out from, too. You know, when I've had burnout, it's from directly from depression. Right, okay, um, yeah not from tired of doing what I'm doing. Yeah. I love tattooing to this day. Uh, if I'm in a depressive mood, it's hard to do it. You yeah. know, it's hard to do anything if you know what depression is, but uh, it's something I've struggled with my whole life, you know, so I'm kind of used to it. And it ebbs and, and waves, you know, um, ebbs and flows, you know. So, so uh, it's just pacing yourself and anticipating, you know, how you're going to deal with shit. But I also think that, you know, with depression comes angry thoughts and disturbing dark thoughts. And I just filter that into my art. Yes. You know, so, I mean, that's the solution ultimately is just venting it. I say all the time, if I wasn't able to vent what's in my head, I would be a serial killer for sure. <laughs> I would be. I know it. Just from my own mentality, when I profile myself, it's like, damn, dude you're a sick fuck, you know, you better paint that. <laughs> yeah, it's cool though, like you, like you said, that you found a way and then obviously other humans yeah. want to wear that, that art. I, I, I think it's true and it's, I don't know, it's almost like an answer to the depressive thoughts, you know, like, because it seems like that you, you found a way to actually quiet your mind there, you know what I mean? Like, uh, getting into a point where you listen to music with no, no lyrics, you, you, right, right. Where you, you just turn off and deal with the, the, the task at hand, which is just letting your mind pour out. And that seems to quell the depressive right. thoughts. I, I mean, obviously not all the time. There, there's, there's obviously no. good days and bad it's not days. Not to do anything, you know. Um, yeah, but, but I mean, no matter whether you're a creative or not, like everyone, going back to the left-right brain thing, not to go into science again, but I'm sorry. I no, that's okay. I love it. You know, uh, uh, basically, Emotional disturbances that come with depression and that sort of thing uh, really come from your right brain. That's where your emotional 
patterns are. Your left brain is logic. Your right brain is 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 empathic and and and, and uh, um, uh, creative. You know, and uh, when you're uh, you need creativity. You need a creative outlet in order to get the right brain to get those emotional disturbances to the surface and worked out in art. So there's a reason so many artists out there, I don't mean tattoo artists, artists in general, all the masters were fucked up in the head. Yeah. Or that's why, you know, they're right brain dominant people. So they tend to be very emotional, flaky, uh, irresponsible. Uh, drug addicts, you name it. It all comes from that, you know? So the ones that have art as a release make amazing art. They're not necessarily healthier, but probably to a degree, you know? I'm sure if Edgar Allan Poe didn't write all the shit he wrote, he'd have died a lot sooner than he did. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I know what you mean. Did you have any, um, like... <sighs> I don't, I don't even know the audio know the answer to this, but did you ever have any formal art training before you did any art? Not really. Uh, some private lessons from a couple people here and there, but nothing of any major mentorship that you'd call it. You know, uh, I spent a lot of time alone as a kid. I was an outcast. And while kids were playing baseball, I was sitting home drawing super villains and how I killed them all, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I didn't really, uh, uh, that's where I got my training, was research and time alone. Uh, there were some illustrators along the way. Uh, Tim Jacobus was a book illustrator that taught me some key things. Um, he did all those Goosebump books, the covers. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right. Um, and... Uh, an art teacher that had an influence on me here and there, like in high school and in grade school, um, helping me find an outlet. And, uh, you know, but like formal training, not really. I got no. kicked out of college in four days, so that didn't really work out, which I'm glad because they just paint you into the box anyway. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of higher education. You know, um, it's one of those things, like, I listen to... <laughs> I don't know about you, you hear so many people go down that road and every pretty much everybody that ever have has, they've never even, they've never used much from it or it, they've always got never, nothing but real negative things to say about it. Not all the time. I have spoke to some artists that have taken a lot from it, but like eight times out of 10, it's generally been, uh, you know, like my, like whenever I did higher education or, 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 you know, like try to go for some formal training in something that I was trying to pursue, I never really used it, man. It, there's nothing, there's nothing like actually just fucking doing it, you know, like uh, to a certain degree, you know, actually just picking something that you want to do and just doing it. And, and, and obviously with tattooing, like you say, you have to learn to a certain degree the, the basics of how to actually put ink into the skin and it heal properly. Once you've got that right. down... Your art is just your art, isn't it? So, Well, you know, there's two things in art. I mean, there's your technique and, and your prowess as an artist with a brush or whatever it may be. But there's also the soul of it, the spirit underneath the art. And you can be an academic artist and learn everything and, 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 and even uh, reproduce Rembrandt, you know? Yeah. But there's no soul. There's no spirit underneath it. See, art speaks to people in two ways. For one... It speaks on the quality of the art, you know, again, the prowess of it, your ability as an artist to express it in whatever direction, whether it's a Pollock or a Rembrandt or whatever. Uh, but then there's also the spirit you put into it. There's an unspoken thing that talks to your subconscious, you know? So like in order to speak to someone's subconscious, you can't tell them how it is. You need to suggest and, maybe influence, but like my paintings, I never talk about what they mean. I don't no. need you to know what they mean to me. It's what it means to you. That's the spirit I'm talking about. What does it move you? How does it move you emotionally? That's art to me. If art does not move me emotionally, then I don't really pay much mind to it. I love a nice basket of fruit, you know, or whatever. That's cool and all, you made it look like a photograph. 
but it's not speaking to me in my soul and like making me feel things that I need to feel or want to feel or not. You know, if my art disturbs people, I'm very happy about that. You know, I had a couple argue over one of my paintings because he wanted to buy it and she refused to have it in her house. You know, and uh, they fought in the middle of a gallery opening loudly about it. And then that was all the payment I needed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you if i could make you do that then i did something you know? yeah that's fucking funny isn't it that kind of pass back and forth between people who are together in a relationship i yeah. mean you see it with tattoos a guy will come in he'll be wanting to get something i had a guy who wanted a chess piece and he wanted skulls and roses as a classic but he wanted so i did a big dirty skull in the middle and some roses at the side i wanted the skull to be the centerpiece he right. absolutely loved what i drew yeah you see he took it to his wife and his wife is like no i don't want to no. have sex with yeah. you and look at that while i'm doing yeah, that yeah, i'm yeah. not doing that you know it's like what, yeah. what at that point like that person is his own person he should be able to wear what he wants but the, the wife or the girlfriend even a girlfriend is like right. No, I, I, you don't need that. I'm, I don't want you to. It's fucking crazy. Humans can be so mad at times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got, I told you I got my bike out a couple of weeks ago or whatever, and I've been riding every day. Well, now, you know, my girlfriend decided she enjoyed riding. So now I got to put a damn sissy bar on the bike so I can I ride her with me. No. Yes, you did. No. I did not. And I'm not into sissy bars That's on my no. bike. I ride a Harley. <laughs> No, no, yeah. No, no, no. yeah. <laughs> That's fucking funny. <laughs> um, did any <laughs> did any of you um? I think you spoke about your dad before. Uh, even lately, you know, did, did any of, any of your relatives do any art of any sort? My father was a knife maker. Oh, okay. And amazing in his day. In '79, they rated him top ten in the world. Uh, made amazing knives he did scrimshaw and engraving and which is funny because he one thing he did teach me was scrimshaw and is similar to tattooing in a way you know scratching into the surface i guess um engraving and that sort of thing uh so you know he was creative my mother poetry uh you know i get something from both of them but those are the only creatives in my family Everyone else is cops and landscapers. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, I do think it's outliers that certain people in, in families can be outliers. It can be generational points where like people, my mom and dad just weren't creative at all. And even my right. brother's not really creative. But then, you know, and then there's just me who just loves to create. I like to play music. I like to draw, right. like, you know, and it's just weird. Sometimes, I don't know if you just, he, op more openly inspired to be creative, don't you? It doesn't need to be passed down from your parents. But if you, if you yeah. know, a good Depends answer. how you are, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, I require, I'm creative because I have to be. It's therapy for me. Yeah. So I make art for therapy, which is required to maintain some degree of sanity, you know? I, I was, and when I was a kid, I was creative because I was good at it, and I got my accolades from it. I was an only child, so the only time I got approval from people, which I needed at a young age, being an only child, was uh through my art so i made more art uh, and that's where it began for me in grade school yeah it was good man dude i have super enjoyed talking to you man we've been talking for nearly an hour and a half and honestly oh, man, wow. <laughs> yeah. i know man and I, I i can't thank you enough for letting me actually talk to you when it when it when event when you when you said yes to doing it i was like yeah man i'm super excited for this it just took a while to get sorted um it's since going back to work everything's fucking busy and it probably will be yeah busy, but i proper enjoyed talking to you um and it was more than i expected as well i've, I've always been a fan of your work from the moment i, I I, I got into tattoos, you, you know, I, I, as soon as I saw your, your work and, and, and I love the dark arts and, and, and bio and things like that, you were the leading, one of the leading proponents, you and Guy Aitchison, it was always Paul, Paul Booth and Guy Aitchison for me, yeah. you know, and then, I'll be, and, then, and, then it, and, then it, and then it like trees down from there. Stand you know? down. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. so cool. thank cool. you. Thank you. Yeah, you got it, man. I had a good time. I hope this works out good for you. And, uh, you know, good luck with your podcast and everything. And, uh, Thank you, man. Thank I'll see you man. down the road somewhere. Yeah, man. I will hopefully cross paths with you one day. I'm sure I will. Um, and yeah, man, hopefully just can speak to more people 
and, and, and get more long form, form conversations like this because I feel like that was a re it's a good relaxed conversation and, and people yeah. can people people need to hear them you know yeah totally yeah so thank you very much brother I will speak to you in the next few days but thanks for coming on man yeah you got it send me a link to the video so I can watch it no worries at all. You know, I love to look at myself. So <laughs> we all do. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, man. All right, man. I'll see you later. See you later, man.